Hi, everybody. Um, students in my world mythology class, people on YouTube, welcome to this introduction to Wirarika mythology, uh, Wichol Cosmovision, and the Hickory Pilgrimage. Here we'll be covering a few of the key Wirarika myths in the Zinc Anthology, assigned this week in Canvas. And we'll also be recreating, going on a little mini version of the traditional Hickory or Peyote pilgrimage from Naharit in the west to Wirikuta. Helpful links and videos this week you'll find in Canvas include, most important for this lecture, uh, Wicholes, The Last Guardians of the Peyote, which features the Ramirez family from San Andreas, who led our journey, more on that soon, and focuses on conflicts with the mining companies in the area. And since I'm not an expert in this field, I also especially recommend the third item here, Wirarica, the Huichol of Mexico, an introductory lecture by Jimena Marquez for a shorter overview of the history and culture. You can find other links in the canvas as well this week, and some of them we'll get to in due course. Two epigraphs for this lecture, which also begin the edited volume, People of the Peyote, Huichol Indian History, Religion and Survival, First by Ulu Tame, Urarika Marikame. If I conduct myself well, if I don't go around doing bad things, if my soul and heart are good and clean, then the gods will look upon me well. It doesn't matter if my hat is old and my clothes are ragged. If my heart is good, then I become a reflection of the gods, like a mirror. And in a very early study on symbolism of the Huichol Indians by Carl Lumholtz, quote, religion is to them a personal matter not an institution, and therefore their life is religious, from the cradle to the grave, wrapped up in symbolism. So who are the Wirarika, as they call themselves, or as they've generally been called by outsiders, the Huicholes? The Huichol or the Wirarika are a distinct indigenous group, a comunidad indígena concentrated in central and western Mexico. The Spanish called them the Huichol, those who flee to the mountains, but they called themselves the Wirarica, the ones who seek deep knowledge. They speak a descendant branch of Uto-Aztec language, also called Wirarica, the name of the language and the people, and they have a distinct and ancient culture, mythology, and cosmovision. Their language is close to the Khoras of Naharit, but distant from the Nahuat of the Aztecs. It is a beautiful and melodious language when prayed and sung. Their culture is among the most ancient that survived colonization less by isolationism, as is commonly said, and more by complex adaptations. It is estimated that there are between 40,000 and 60,000 Wirarica living across Mexico and some locales in the U.S., in both remote, rural, and urban regions, and this is up from previous counts in the 20th century. Exact numbers are hard to come by due to the difficulty of obtaining census in remote areas of Mexico. The Wirarica are most famous for two things. Their visionary bead and weaving art, some of which you'll see in the pictures for this lecture, and the touristic export of which has become one of the mainstays of their economic well-being. And two, their use of peyote, or hickory as they call it in Maraica, in religious rituals, which in recent decades has been legally protected by the Mexican government from over-harvesting by profiteers and spiritual seekers. Before we go into these aspects of their culture, let's further introduce their history, culture, and mythology. As you can see in the map on the top left here, traditional Wirarica territory extends from the west, the province and mythical protector, Naharit, through the states of Durango, Jalisco, Zacatecas, and San Luis Potosi. The majority of Wirarica are concentrated in these physical and mythological homelands, which are oriented from west to east. The west, from San Blaise, is the place of the shadows and darkness where life began overseen by feminine water or growth goddesses such as Nakawe, and the east, the peyote deserts, are a place of dawning and light, where the sun, Tayao or Tao, and grandfather fire, Tatavari, and the mediating spirit, Cayumare, all preside. The Spanish conquest of Mexico was begun by Cortes in the 1520s, and soon after extended into traditional Wirarica homelands. But the Wirarica proved exceptionally resistant to Franciscan missionaries and to socio-economic subordination to the New World Order. At first, they tended to take refuge from the Spanish alongside the Cores and the Tepajuanos in the Sierra Madre mountain ranges, and hence the name given to them by the Spanish, the Huicholes. This protected the Wirarica for another 200 years, 
missionaries only penetrating the Sierras with their armies after 1722. Fast forward another 200 years to 1934, and that's when American anthropologist Robert M. Zing did fieldwork in the Wuraika village of Tuxpan. After great persistence, he collects from a single, hesitant and not always reliable informant, Juan Real, our earliest and most comprehensive body of Huichol myths. Juan Real feared that someone will work sorcery against me for having told you these delicate things. Zink published his PhD thesis in 1938 as the Huichols, primitive artists. The stories in this work became more widely available in Spanish in 1982 and 1998 as La Mitología de los Huicholes, out of print and not easy to find. An English translation was published a few years later by Fikes, Weigand and Weigand, and it's from this book that most of the sources I've assigned for this week can be found. Just a side note here, as the editors and translators of this edition point out, Zink's spellings can be quite uncertain. He uses the barred L to stand for the more commonly heard R sound. Thus he spells Tatavari as Tatavali, and Cayumare as Cayumali. As an apprenticing Maracame or Huichol medicine man informed me, this is not incorrect, but reflects a lack of consensus for spelling in the Wirarika alphabet. For example, the X in Wirarika is pronounced and written with a rolling R sound. I'll try to use the standard spellings from recent work on Wirarika mythology here, but as pronunciation has never been a strong suit, please forgive any mistakes along the way. Since the arrival of the conquistadors and missionaries, the Wiraika have faced one challenge after another to their traditional way of life and culture. During the 16th to the 18th centuries, they faced war, diseases, theft of the majority of their historical homeland, Christian missionization, forced labor in mines, alcohol, destruction of their temples, loss of many songs and sacred places. This all led to what's known as the Great Rebellion of 1856, and a period of renewed independence when the Wiraika burned missions and reconstructed temples and consolidated their communities. During the 19th to the 20th centuries to the old challenges were added a few new ones. For example, conflicts with mestizos and Mexicans over land ownership and cattle grazing rights in their homelands and along their pilgrimage routes, economic hardships leading to the pesticide poisonings of families as day laborers for agribusiness, since the 1960s, the building of highways across their pilgrimage routes, and since the 1970s, and Carlos Castaneda's pseudo-anthropology, with its sections on peyote, or mescalito, a veritable spiritual invasion, leading to over-harvesting and incorrect harvesting of their medicine by New Age seekers and profiteers. And since the 1990s, renewed sale by the Mexican government of mining operations in the mountainous region of their most sacred site of all, Wirikuta. As Jimena Marquez points out in her excellent introduction, most Wirarika are materially poor, but they are spiritually rich and take a justifiable pride in how well they've preserved their customs and traditions. Distinctive Wirarika circular temples, or Kaliways, go back, say the archaeologists, to around 200 CE. Their culture, its subsistence on maize from very old seeds of four colors of corn, blue, red, yellow, and white, and their ritual use of peyote may be either younger or older than this date, until the Spanish finally conquered Mesa del Naharit in 1722. The Coras and maybe the Wararica actively consulted mummified ancestors. Despite such outliers, by 1650, almost all the Wararica were brought under colonial control. By 1750, most had assimilated the Spanish political and religious systems, most often without converting to Christianity, or by making only partial concessions to it. Fikes and wagons point out how drastically silver mining in Mexico from the time of the Spanish conquest altered the course of world history. By 1546, silver production in the Americas increased the world's silver supply by 300%, then 800%. The inflationary effect resulted in the Ottoman Empire's silver losing 50% of its value, which in turn undermined Islamic economic power more or less permanently, while also propelling the African slave trade and the wage slavery of indigenous peoples to keep the mines running. Given this traumatic history extending from Tepic to Real de Catorce, it is shocking to see in our documentary for this week the blithe ignorance with which foremen, mine workers, lobbyists and politicians justify the resumption of silver production in the region. 
By 1702, mining and other wealth extracting practices led to the Huichol Tepecano uprisings throughout the district of Colotlan. Dissidents asserting their thievery of cattle was necessary to feed their families since the Spanish families had stolen most of their subsistence lands. Around this time, 1,500 warriors stormed Colotlan and executed Captain Mateo de Silva, also demanding that native ownership of lands be recognized by the Spanish crown. Of course, the crown deployed strategies to quell immigration-fueled rebellion and reassimilate dissidents into the existing political system. By 1686, the King of Spain was designing special policies to bring the indomitable Coras and Wiraica under Spanish control through forced conversion to Catholicism. This failed since the ancestors had not authorized accepting Christ as God. The Spanish realized they could only be conquered by force. In 1783, the magistrate of Bolanos declared that the Huichols still did not comprehend Catholic sacraments and ceremonies, did not attend Mass, nor marry under the auspices of the Church. Even worse, they still practiced their aboriginal rituals. By 1798, Franciscan missionaries had all but given up. By 1811, the Mexican fight for independence from Spain put a 30-year halt on missionary activity in the area. And by 1839, while the Wirarica had accepted Hispanic political order and religious organization, they had still kept to their ancestral customs. Friar Buenaventura observed, they did invoke Christ and Catholic saints to bless cattle, but never made the sign of the cross, confessed sins in church, or recited Catholic prayers. He also observed that they considered Catholic churches to be desecrated, unholy places, and that they worshipped idols, which he destroyed. When I showed Clemente Ramirez Zing's study, Clemente being one of our two Wirarica guides on the shortened version of the pilgrimage from San Blaise to Wiricuta, more on that soon, Clemente turned immediately to this map, pointed out that his family was from San Andres, or San Andreas Comieta, one of the first Wirarica regions to be missionized, with only partial success, after 1733. From 1843 to 1861, the Franciscan missionaries doubled down, destroying temples and shrines and rounding up homeless Wirarica for Christ. The friars admitted repeatedly that they were losing the battle to save Huichol's souls, due to their subsistence lifestyle and decidedly non-Christian ceremonials involving much ancestor worship and animal sacrifice. Missionary boarding schools were established. By 1856, Wirarca participated in the so-called Great Rebellion, mentioned earlier, led by Manuel Lozada, which saw the burning of missions, reconstructed temples, and consolidated communities. By 1861, federal legal reforms initiated in the late 1850s closed the last convents and missions in Mexico, effectively secularizing the clergy. Missionary activity was no longer state-sanctioned. The Rarica people, with their deep commitment to their ancestral customs, had effectively survived colonization from this moment forward, although there were many more challenges ahead. By 1914, Wirarica were lending their support to the Mexican Revolution and further ousting the Franciscans, and it was to this historical context that Zing arrived among the Huichols of Tuxpan in 1934. He observed how the Wirarica had by then adopted many Christian myths and ceremonials, such as Cambio de la Varas, Carnival, and Semana Santa, but also that they had done so without compromising or eroding their own myths, ritual cycles, and ceremonials, and subsistence-based way of life. As we've seen since the beginning of the colonial period, Huichols were induced to work in mines, and others were forced illegally. Many others fled mining and other industrial areas, including crop, cattle, and timber harvesting. The overall Wirarica relation to evangelization over these centuries, as Fikes and Wigans point out, followed Spicer's incorporative model. New elements conformed to existing patterns without fundamental disruption or change. Catholic chronicles and myths were adapted in oral history and in the annual ritual cycle. Another example is to be found in Peyote, the last of the Medicine Men documentary, in the ritual renaming of all items in the everyday world during the pilgrimage to Wirikuta. Santa Catarina will be called Eagle. The Virgin Mary of Guadalupe will be called Eagle Mother. An important example of myth adaption concerns Christ's sacrifice and betrayal in the New Testament, understood by the Wirarica in terms of economic alteration brought about by the Spaniards. Quote, For them, the Wirarica of Tuxpan and San Sebastian 
The sacrifice of Jesus Christ established the world's economy in which silver money circulates as a medium of exchange. In 1934, Tuxpan Huichols viewed Christ's betrayal for 30 pieces of silver as a crucial event, one which initiated capitalism. The Chronicle of Christ's Betrayal, Crucifixion and Resurrection was recited during Tuxpan's Semana Santa, Holy Festival Week. Without having read Marx on alienated labor, of course, the Urarica intuited that silver mining and Christ are part of the same colonial system. This contains a kernel of truth. The betrayal and crucifixion did result in the spread of Christianity and eventually its new political theology and economic world order. That being a brief historical overview, let's turn now to Urarica religion and mythology. Their ceremonial centers are called Tuxipa or Kaliwe, usually but not always round or oval-shaped temples. And there are many annual ritual cycles to be performed at them, and many sacred places to visit, generally in order to feed, honor, and please ancestral deities. The famous peyote hunt is one of several subsistence-oriented rituals held at such huicho ceremonial centers. For the Wirarika, the natural environment was originally established by deified ancestors, such as great-grandmother germination, also called Grandmother Growth, Takutsi, Grandfather Fire, Tetevari, Father Sun, Tayao, and Kayumare, their tutelary spirit and world organizer. As Zing observes, the Wicho regard wind as unusually sacred and a favorite form of the messenger of the gods. There is some argument about whether the Wirarika worship gods in the usual sense, Spanish dioses y diosas, since all their deities personify ancestral yet concrete natural phenomena. The four elements, rain, wind, and the weather, plants, and animals, etc. There are also many mediating or half-bad trickster deities, like Kayumare. Wirarika deities rarely, if at all, appear as transcendent and abstract. Rather, they are imminent and concrete. Performing rituals strictly in time-honored ways replicates the world-organizing precedents their ancestors set. The annual ritual cycle encompasses deer and rabbit hunting, fishing, maize agriculture, and especially, for the marakame or medicine men at least, the pilgrimage to Wirikuta to honor and collect the year's supply of hickory, peyote. Besides subsistence and sacred trade of peyote, conch shells, feathers, silver, participation in the cycle bestows education and confers prestige. Community service is valued to qualify as a healer, singer, or ritual leader, five to ten years of service, including a year as a temple officer, are first of all required. As Fikes and Weigens conclude their introduction, quote, the primary purpose of the Wicho ceremonial cycle and the myths intrinsic to it is to maintain positive relationships with ancestors who control nature and its processes. As long as the Wichos properly perform the rituals, that perpetuate the world their ancestors organized, they are convinced that they will be blessed with good health and abundant subsistence. Proper recitation of myths and performance of ritual holds disorder in abeyance and ensures the Wichols that they have little reason to fear sickness or starvation. As Dale Pendel summarizes Wichol ceremonial in the chapter on peyote in his book Pharmacognosis, quote, fierce resistance, both armed and diplomatic, and strategic retreats to inaccessible areas saved the Wichols from conquest and enabled them to maintain the old ways to a remarkable degree. Still, it is a living and an evolving tradition and cannot be extrapolated backwards in time to represent a typical peyote ceremonialism of three or five hundred years in the past. Peyote is part of an encompassing worldview in which human beings are involved in reciprocal obligations to a large number of supernatural deities. Some of these deities are elementals, fire, gentle rain, storm, and lightning rain, maize, but almost all of them have specific residences, special places where they hang out. And it is these locations, often long distances from the Huichol ranchos, that offerings must be left. To the Huichols, unlike the Tarahumara, who sometimes buy peyote, only plants gathered on the pilgrimage to sacred Wirikuta are good peyote. So that being a bit of historical and mythological or religious backgrounds to the Wirarika, their culture and history, I'd like to do a little background now as to how I became interested in this after journeying to Wirakuta about 20 years ago and not really knowing what it was at the time. 
and then returning about 20 years later before writing up this lecture. In fall 2002, after graduating with a BA in philosophy from the University of British Columbia, I was invited to go on a caravan journey with a group of Canadian seekers to connect with Mexican alternative communities. The caravan was organized by Chris Kawak. More on him in a minute. These were the old Jose Arguelles from Y2K to 2012 days, although some of the contacts we made were quite traditional. It was a many-month journey that saw us spending time at sacred sites and with communities in Guadalajara, León, San Luis Potosi, Mexico City, Tepotzlan, Palenque, and the Yucatan Peninsula. Highlights included living for a month with a Nahuatl Aztec medicine man, Don Jose Caldera, there on the right, and his wife, Donna Lesvia, where they ran a vegetarian restaurant and healing practice in León, as well as visiting the ruins at Teotihuacan, Chichen Itza, and living in Palenque for a month studying the Popol Vuh. You can actually contact Don Jose today and visit him in León. There's a link to his Facebook. So one of the most memorable experiences of the trip was traveling to the peyote deserts near San Luis Potosi. Don Jose, my teacher at the time, advised me that the peyote medicine was intense and solar, and not for me, who he had thought of as more of a lunar sort. Perhaps also, I was a little too singed back then anyway, and it showed. Following Don Jose's advice, when we in our caravan arrived at a beautiful watering hole in the deserts nearby Real de Catorce, I set up camp for the night to go to sleep while the others harvested and participated in a peyote ceremony. What happened next was unexpected. First, I drifted into and out of consciousness as I heard diverse herds of animals, wild horses, coyotes, and possibly deer, taking turns drinking from the watering hole. Then I drifted into a visionary dream, in which I saw a deeply aquamarine blue figure dancing in Wirarika art-style splendor. However, I had virtually no exposure to Huichol art at the time and was in complete ignorance of the culture. The figure I saw in my dream was holding what looked like a feathered wand, I would later discover a muieri, and a nierica in his other hand, a little visionary mirror, and he was doing a subtle dance to eerie, exotic-sounding music. At the time, I having only read Carlos Castaneda and Antonin Artaud, I thought I was meeting the deity called Mescalito and that the music I was hearing was somehow foreign, outside the western tonal scale. The visionary dream was sustained for many minutes, as the figure seemed to be inviting and beckoning me into the blue deity's desert cosmovision. Again, the dream occurred before consuming any peyote. It was precognitive. I heard later that as I was dreaming, Chris, who was quite a distance away, received a message from the peyote that he should go and fetch me. And at this very moment, a herd of horses rushed past him, the wind almost knocking him over. Chris and Shelby walked for kilometers in the desert to find me, and then Shelby, a big fellow, tripped and crashed into my tent. If I wasn't awake already, I certainly was then. And so I went back with them to the ceremony. I ate very little medicine, but was up all night and through the next day with very powerful visions, which I wrote down in a little journal, now lost. My experience was not dissimilar to that described by Antonin Artaud in his voyage to the Tarahumaras. Near to the start, I had visions of being assimilated by little mouths which looked like vaginas with teeth. I'd later discover a big mythological motifs for the Wichols into the consciousness of the desert. I saw the desert in a transfigured way, as if from within its own consciousness. As the sun rose, I journaled everything I saw for hours. What I did not understand at the time was that the deity I had met in that dream was not at all what Castaneda had called Mescalito, but the Wirarica trickster god Cayumare, or the Blue Deer. Material to read on Wichol mythology in English was harder to come by back then. For example, the translation we're working on from Singh's Wichol mythology was not published until 2004. Life went on, and after living in South America for another six months, I ended up returning to study with Jack Derrida at his last Beast and the Sovereign seminar in Irvine in 2003, before going on to do an MA in Continental Philosophy and then a PhD. The image of Cayumare dancing and beckoning never left me, however, but I didn't know clearly then that I had met the deity whose name literally means one who goes everywhere boldly. Fast forward 20 years and the very same friend, Chris Kowak, who led our caravan back in 2002, reached out to invite me on a small pilgrimage with a Maracame, Jose Luis or Katira Ramirez, 
there on the bottom right, and his sons, Clemente and Hermenegildo, from San Andres in the western Sierra Madre. And the Ramirez family is the very one featured in the documentary for this week. Turns out that Chris had been following the medicine path and returning to study under Jose Luis and others for over 20 years and had been initiated as Americana himself. Their planned pilgrimage from San Blas to Wirikuta coincided with the spring break from teaching at Sac State, and so I decided it was time to return to the San Luis Potosi Desert and attempt to figure out what I had dreamed 20 years earlier. Here's a link to Chris Cowick's website, where on occasion you can find offerings for ceremonial journeys, similar to this one, or in other traditions he's apprenticed to. So now we've introduced the Wirarika, their culture and religion for a bit, and the context for my experience of this culture, which is still very limited. So what I would like to do in the rest of this lecture is two things simultaneously. First, I'll summarize and interpret a few of the vast body of myths which underlie the Wiraika cosmovision. And as we do this, I'll situate and interpret these myths as they arose and were experienced during this actual pilgrimage occurring in March 2023. Let's take the epigraph for this next portion of the lecture, again from the opening of the late Dale Pendel's excellent chapter on peyote in the Pharmacognosis book, The Ally, Peyote or Hickory, It is good that you are here. I ask the Creator to help the right things to come to you in a good way. I pray that no bad accidents befall you, and that if you see or hear something here that moves you, if something touches you, you will use it in the right way that the blessing may be passed on to your loved ones and to all your relatives and to your co-workers at your job and to all those people that you touch with your life, that it benefit the earth and all beings. That is what we do here. So as mentioned earlier, Wirarika territory, Cosmovision, and the Hickory pilgrimage is oriented from west to east. The west is the origin of life and the domain of the water goddess Aramara. The east is the sacred desert of Wirikuta, up to the Cerro Camado, the birthplace of the sun. Now our group met the night before the beginning of the pilgrimage in Tepic, and on the first morning we had to take a colectivo out to San Blas in Naharit to ask permission from Haramara, Mother Ocean, for the journey. The entire Huichol community of San Andres had already gone to San Luis Potosi earlier in March, and so this was an exclusive pilgrimage just for us outsiders. As it turned out, Jose Luis was unable to make the journey. He was stuck in Peru. And so he sent his son Clemente, also featured in the documentary, to lead us instead, alongside his brother, Hermenegildo, and apprenticing Maracame. Alongside the two Maracame, our group numbered 10. There were seven Canadians, including myself and my partner Marissa, a Mexican-Polynesian-American, for whom this was her first visit to Mexico. The three older Canadians, beside myself, were deeply involved in medicine paths already. Sergei was a hilarious Russian-Canadian, and he'd studied at ayahuasca retreats many times in Peru and led ceremonies in Ontario. Rufus also led medicine circles, temascals, or sweat lodges, and taught shamanic drumming and singing, and led a choir during the COVID years, which Sergei had been a part of. Hearing their song on the journey and during the ceremony was great. Terry, another member of the journey, was raised in the Shinabe traditions and is the daughter of Setting Sun White Bear, a Canadian who became deeply involved in indigenous communities and who was one of Chris's teachers as well for 10 years. Uh, she was along for the journey to mourn the memory of her father and to reconnect with the medicine. The two younger Canadians, Derek and Eric, not kidding, were also deeply involved in ayahuasca medicine circles in Toronto and super interesting. Derek was a professional photographer and took a lot of photos along the way, which we're still waiting to receive, and did an interview with the Marikame, which I'm hoping to include at the end of this video. Everyone in this group, you can see the Marikames over here, and all us Canadians over here, everybody on the group was so loving and real and wise. It felt a lot like a long lost family get together. Nobody except our guide, Chris, extensively, and myself, but once, had been to central Mexico and partaken of peyote in the past. So in his recent book, Beyond Peyote, Kiri and the Huichol Deer Shaman, Jay Fikes, an expert in this field, briefly summarizes the peyote pilgrimage. Quote, the most momentous obligation of their temple ritual cycle has been the performance of arduous annual pilgrimages to procure peyote and deposit offerings for the Sun Father at the volcanic mountain region where he emerged near Real de Catorce in the Mexican state of San Luis Potosi. 
The 700-kilometer round trip made on foot became indispensable to ensure rain, which is essential for the survival of the huichol and their maize, and to achieve social status by becoming kawiteru, an authority on ritual oratory. Inviting rain mothers to return to the huichol homeland at the end of the dry season is accomplished through the performance of the peyote dance ritual. Or as Del Pendel summarizes the ritual cycle, Many acts of ritual purification are demanded of the peyote pilgrims. On the night before embarking on the pilgrimage, the peyoteros bathe, offer prayers, burn five tortillas in the fire, and sleep with their families in the sacred godhouse, the temple where the sun and the moon meet. Once the pilgrimage begins, the participants must abstain from sex, bathing, and salt. New pilgrims, those making the journey for the first time, are blindfolded when approaching the many sacred places along the way where prayers are offered. For the Huichol, that a mining town like Catorce lies at the end point of their pilgrimage on the edge of Wirakuta is a temporary blip of history, hardly worthy of notice. Dale wrote this before the renewed interest of mining companies in the area, fortunately. So once we arrived in San Blaise, in addition to the offerings to Haramara, Mother Ocean, we've been asked to bring already, we needed to procure flowers, candles, and chocolate. We then had to journey across the channel on a boat to one of the most sacred sites to all the Wirarika, the sacred white rock, called Wariwe, where life began. Nearby was a Marikame altar, or Kaliwe, house or altar of the gods, seen here, and not circular in this case, across from a cave, not pictured here, with a recently sacrificed deer, and outside of which our first ceremony began. Pictures were not allowed to be taken during any of the ceremonies. Outside of the Kalewe, we made offerings of prayers and tobacco to Grandfather Fire, Tatavari, Nuestro Abuelo, our grandfather, and to Father Son, Tayao, Nuestro Padre, and to Takutsi Nakawe, Grandmother Growth. We asked permission to journey on to the ocean and the rock of life. Each participant was given a candle to light at the next ceremony. Prayers were spoken by Clemente in Wirarica in Spanish and translated for us while Clemente did the blessings on each of us. After another walk towards Haramara in the midday sun, we arrived at the ocean and the white rock, Wariwe, where life first began for the Huichols during the time when the sun had not yet risen. Here Clemente led a ceremony honoring the wind, the elements, the directions, and the ancestors especially Takutsi Nakawe and Haramara, associated with the ocean, fertility, stars and rain, and with the primordial darkness before light emerged and life began. Participants made offerings of personal objects and tobacco for permission to begin the pilgrimage. Our candles were lit ceremonially and offered to the ocean. Mythologically, aspects of the ritual, not all of which we understood in translation, may have corresponded to parts of the assigned story for this week. The first peyote deer journey brings the sun to the sky, which begins with the goddess Nakawe as mistress of the stars, present when the earth was made and rain fell on the sea for the first time. The stars then emerged from the water as balls or circles and went up to the sky where they shine. In the water were bad snakes of different colors, representing both the origin of life and the necessity of death. The stars killed some of the snakes at Nakawe's command, and Nakawe pleaded with the snakes, please don't take my people to the sea. But the snakes did, and many drowned. One of the snakes was saved from the stars and had many children, like balls of cotton, a cloud symbol, or stones. Nakawe named the new snakes and long lists of male and female snake goddesses are given. Among the names are Kayumare, whose origins are here related to Nakawe's dual aspect as a celestial star goddess and germinal darkness. In the myth we're reading this week, Kumukame, father of the wolf people, is then placed by Nakawe as the leader of the snake deities. But when I asked Clemente about Kumukame, he said he did not recognize him as an ancestral deity and said it was probably a myth from another tribe. I wasn't quite able to figure out if Haramara is the same goddess as Takutsi Nakawe. It's interesting that in this origin myth for the goddess Nakawe, she's originally the mistress of stars, that is a celestial goddess. 
but also associated with the dark and with the chthonic, with the time when the earth was made and when rain fell on the sea for the first time. In this cosmovision, the water of the ocean and the rain that falls upon it seem to be associated with serpents, who are associated with the beginning of life at this very stone, Wariwe, and who are called bad probably because they are associated with the necessity of death and not only the origin of life. The battle between the stars and the snakes is interesting and seems to be an origin myth for Nakawe's presence and power in the world. Nakawe saving some snakes and creating a long list of male and female snake deities, goddesses and gods, including the culture hero, trickster and mythic founder Kayumare, suggests that this myth has some pretty deep levels regarding her functions in the Wichil Cosmovision. Although this myth in the Zinc anthology doesn't correspond exactly to Clemente's version, which we only half understood, at one point he mentioned to me how many Wirarika myths have yet to be transcribed. The rest of this myth does provide a helpful framing for the general origin narrative of the peregrinaje or pilgrimage from San Blaise to San Luis Potosi. In this version, which I've assigned this week, the primordial culture hero, Kumukame, makes a drum at the edge of the sea, exactly where we were, and begins to sing. He sings of the deer hunt and the deer feast, and all his snake people attempt, at first very unsuccessfully, to hunt the deer with ceremonial arrows. The hunt is unsuccessful, because meanwhile, the arsonist Wrath Towamo sabotages the connection to the deities by burning down the ceremonial houses of the Wiraika with all their sacred paraphernalia inside. The snake people consult Nakawe, the goddess of stars and of rain, and Tatavari, grandfather of fire, and build new houses and new paraphernalia. Note that here in this myth and all across the myths in the Zinc anthology, we find a basic duality of two main deities in the Wiraika pantheon. Tatavari and Nakawe, Grandfather Fire, Grandmother Growth, which seem to represent igneous and aquatic elements. It reminds me a bit of debates in pre-Socratic philosophy about what is the original element, with Thales arguing that it's water and Heraclitus arguing that it's fire. The Warika pantheon seems to be divided along these elemental lines, on the one hand deities of fire and on the other of water usually representing male and female principles, and involving many struggles between the two elements in many myths. Going back to the first peyote deer journey, the deer's tracks are followed by the snake people all over the world, and eventually, after many comic failed attempts, Surawe, a star, with the help of Renu, a snake deity, are successful. This is after Surawe scores a direct hit to the head of the deer that only manages to outrage the deer who then shoots clouds from his antlers and mouth and carries off the arrow between his horns, the people shouting, there he goes again. In this origin myth for the hunting of the blue deer, it is Renu who from a great distance first pierces the heart of the deer, followed by Surawe, Kumukame singing of the deeds in celebration. The wounded deer, losing a lot of blood, escapes and is healed on a mountain after he encounters turkey buzzard who heals his wounds with magic beads and thereby covers his blood tracks. When discovered by the hunting party, Turkey Buzzard acts innocent, as if he hasn't seen the fleeing deer, and is then punished with the hole in his nose. Meanwhile, the deer has died, after all, from gnats and maggots, but he is resurrected when the now super-smelling Turkey Buzzard, due to his injury, in full ceremonial array, finds him. The deer does not realize he was dead, believing he was only sleeping and is grateful for being resurrected by Turkey Buzzard. The deer is sent ahead, out of the Sierras and into the Peyote country, for his safety, where he will find his father, the son, Tao, as well as Cayumare and Palicata, more commonly known as Tamatsi Parietsica, Nuestro Hermano Mayor, or Elder Deer Brother, to whom the deer tells his story, a story which the two brothers, Cayumare and Tamatsi Parietsica, learned to sing. The sun, Tao, invites the great gods to a feast in the desert, above all, Tatavari. And this is how the hunting pilgrimage to see the mother of the deer is established for the followers of the sun. There are many deers in Wichil cosmology, and they sometimes overlap. For example, here, Kayumare and Tamatsi Parietsika, elsewhere, Tetsutsi Marakswari, grandfather deer, 
and the dear mother. The myth goes on to recount the original journey to the desert. At this time, the sun still lived by the sea, and the hunters had to go by the light of the moon. After four nights of fasting, the hunting party, arriving at a sacred site in the country beyond Zacatecas, on the fifth night they gathered around a camp without a fire and were threatened by the animals of the sun. The moon at this time does not give them enough light, and the wind carries off their clothes. They seek a visionary dream, which sends them back five days towards the west, to Tetavari, for the fire needed to fend off the animals of the sun. And so they set off on the journey again, now better equipped and protected with the tiapali, or god disc, given by Tetavari, and sacred plumes to light a fire. During these five-day journeys, they can neither eat nor drink. If they were successful, they would find candles, bread and meat at the home of the deer. One of the party breaks fast, however, by eating nopales cactus on the way and is turned into a rat, ever after eating only nopales. Looking for the house of the deer, the hunting party must pray and perform ceremony and be baptized by water without drinking it and receive a blessing from the mother of the deer. Then they journeyed for five more days in order to arrive at the upper world, the Niwatari, where they looked for the tracks of the deer, their father, Peyote. We'll return to this interesting and dense myth of the first Peyote or deer journey and hunt soon. Our journey to the desert was definitely not so intense. After the asking of permission rituals at San Blaise, we stayed another night at Tepic before setting out by bus the next morning with the Maracame, first to Guadalajara, then on another long bus ride to San Luis Potosi. The next morning, we were already on another bus north to the Peyote Desert, not far from Real de Catorce. Traditionally, this journey with all the stops at sacred sites along the way may take weeks or months and would pass over many mountain ridges. In the myth we just heard, it took even longer due to the necessity of returning in order to bring Tatavari or Grandfather Fire along. We were told that Clement, his father, Jose Luis Catira, had done the journey by foot on three occasions, although this has become uncommon even among dedicated pilgrims. While not completely fasting or going without water, as in the myth, we were on a restricted diet, at least most of us, involving minimum rations with no meat, salt or sex. Before long, we had arrived and were staying in a beautiful house owned by environmentalists, known as the Vigilancia, or Committee of Ecological Vigilance, who were there to preserve and protect Wiraika culture and the desert, and rented out the house to those making the pilgrimage. By that afternoon, the Amerikame were leading us into the desert to hunt the blue deer. As instructed, we all wore white for our first expedition, which lasted about five hours in the sweltering afternoon heat, although a couple of baby peyotes were found early on and offered to appropriately, this was followed by a few hours of fruitless searching. For the untrained eye, the small cacti are almost invisible at first glance and often camouflaged by shrub roots and fertile alkaline dust. As we had been told, the desert was nothing of the sort, but rather a paradise teeming with life and countless species of birds shrubs, trees, flowers, cacti, and animals. Wild horses ran freely and oases surrounding watering holes could be seen dotting the landscape. The Wirikuta mountain ranges looked down upon us as we searched. In many places it was sad to see holes in the desert where peyote had been harvested improperly, pulled up by the root, rather than only the head which allows the cactus to regrow and propagate. As in the myth, the desert seemed the same in all directions, and it became a matter of tuning into one's heart to notice the great variations from place to place, thus learning how to hunt the blue deer, Cayumare. We were under instructions from our guide and the Marikame as to what to do should we find it. First, we must alert the others so that the Marikame could be present. Then, the first discovery by an individual must be offered and prayed to in specific ways by the offering of tobacco, water, chocolate, meaningful crystals, and prayers, and then blessed in its thriving growth and future family. Only the second discovered button could be harvested and consumed after praying to it, asking permission, and honestly listening to the response. All harvesting of buttons beyond the first and the second 
should be done by the Merikame, the only ones allowed to carry the medicine in their sacks. Without them present, anyone faced prison sentences of 10 to 15 years. The peyote should only be cut with a sharp stone or non-metallic implement, Chris informed us, and its heart had to be opened and hairs removed. No peyote buttons of less than five segments were to be harvested. All were excited to try to find their first and second buttons, but for many this was extremely difficult and hours went by. The Marikame kept venturing deeper into the prickly, hazard-filled high desert, full of snakes and scorpions, thorns and spines, until they could not be seen at all. So some of us had to turn back, although we later heard the Marikame had been successful in hunting Kayumare, the blue deer. But those who were not would have another chance tomorrow, before the all-night ceremony. When I found my first button the next day, I offered to it tobacco, a quartz crystal, and a flask of holy water from the Castilian spring of the god Apollo at Delphi. Now I want to go on a brief digression here about whether what we were doing as part of this pilgrimage, under the guidance of two Marikames and Chris, was okay. That is, whether peyote is an indigenous medicine and should not be used by outsiders, whether it is more ethical for outsiders like us to avoid peyote ceremonials like this altogether. As Michael Pollan concludes after much soul-searching in his 2021 book, This Is Your Mind on Plants, and the fifth episode of How to Change Your Mind on Netflix, we best honor indigenous people on our search for plant medicine when we leave peyote alone. These issues, especially in the US and Mexico, get complicated and many-sided. City councils, starting with Oakland and since spreading around the country, have been enacting legislation to decriminalize all medicinal plants for personal and recreational use, the so-called decriminalized nature movement. Initially, no exception was made for peyote, and this caused a massive backlash among Native American communities who feared that decriminalization would lead to a surge of use among non-natives and increased poaching in the peyote lands and thus more recent city initiatives towards decriminalization tend to make an exception for peyote. Since peyote takes a very long time to grow, many years, the danger of cultural and ecological damage is real. The Native American Church and other groups such as the IPCI or Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative have fought hard, first to protect their religious freedom to use peyote under the First Amendment in the 1990s and now to protect this practice from outsiders for whom they hope it remains illegal. The Huerarca, harvesting their sacred medicine in central Mexico, face similar challenges. In some regions, over-harvesting or incorrect harvesting by indigenous peoples and outsiders has led to great scarcity. For all its faults in selling parts of the land in Wirikuta to mining companies, the Mexican government does respect the exclusive legal rights of Huerarca, Tarahumaras and Cora to harvest and carry the sacred medicine. So reviewing this material from Poland after returning from this pilgrimage, I kept asking myself while writing this lecture if what we were doing is okay. In Why We Chose Attract and Resist Outsiders, Fike discusses how Castaneda's fake anthropology contributed to naive and romanticized accounts of the Wichol, like those of First and Meyerhoff, during the peak of the psychedelic revolution, which led to a few New Age American tour guides and unauthorized outsiders who harassed peyote hunters and brought unwanted attention from the Mexican authorities, which contributed to new social problems among the Huichols due to their marijuana cultivation. He concludes, Huichol health and prosperity depend on resolving these issues, such as the legalization of marijuana, as well as gaining greater legal protection for peyote, especially in the area around Riel de Cotorce, where it is rapidly becoming extinct. The need to protect peyote for future generations is urgent. The question of whether it is appropriate for outsiders to participate at all in the peyote hunt and ceremonies as we were doing, even with the permission and presence of Wiraarca guides, is still a live wire, and many might disagree that our presence and purpose there was okay. Many, far from all Wiraarca, are friendly and inclusive, and they tend to see all beings in nature and all human beings as sacred. They continue to struggle, however, with defining what is appropriate and inappropriate for outsiders to see, to know, and to participate in. Some Wiraika communities and families are open to forming relationships with respectful outsiders, like Chris did with Jose Luis and his family. 
in part because they are keenly aware of the value of gaining support and assistance from the global community confronting the challenges they face. And as far as I am aware, beyond the widespread sale of their sacred art, there is no large-scale peyote tourism industry among the Wirarika. I have found no instances of Wirarika healers and singers promoting ecotourism journeys online for outsiders for a huge fee, as occurs in widespread and often problematic ways in Peru. And it appeared that our Wirarika guides were willing to share this experience and their sacred ceremony as part of a provisional experiment in cultural exchange. And they also had plans to visit Canada in the summer and to lead ceremonies there with Chris. Nonetheless, hesitation and ambivalence could sometimes be perceived. At one point during the ceremony, later that night, for example, Clemente asked us all point-blank to give account of ourselves to Cayumare and explain why we had come and what we were seeking. He expressed some doubt about whether our presence in the sacred deserts of Wirikuta and participation in their ceremony would be acceptable to Cayumare and the Wirarika deities residing in that place. Since we were invited by Wirarika themselves to participate in this pilgrimage, and since all peyote harvested, with the exception of that used during the ceremony, was taken by indigenous guides back to their home communities, and since we did not harvest any peyote incorrectly or for use beyond the ceremonies, and since our intentions were to learn respectfully, I am leaning towards thinking that what we were doing was okay, but I'm aware not all would agree, and I still feel of two minds. For more on this controversial topic, check out Alexander Dawson's talk, Peyote's Race Problem, on YouTube, and the interesting exchange he has with an indigenous person in the audience in the talk. And for more on the issue at Wirikuta in particular, you can see this New York Times article, Inside a Peyote Pilgrimage, Drug Tourists, Mining Companies, and Farming Encroachment are Threatening the Wirarika People's Annual Hunt for the Psychedelic Plant in the Mexican Desert. So let's turn back to the assigned myths for this week and pick up where we left off in the zinc version of the first peyote deer journey brings the sun to the sky, ceremonies during and after the journey. Let's pick up where we left off. Upon finding the peyote, as we were just doing, the hunting party in the myth takes five arrows from their quivers for their bows and they climbed up a little mesa and there they saw the deer alone by the Niwatali. This was the deer hidden by the buzzard. Others soon saw him. Then slowly, in a long line, they began to encircle the deer. Every track the deer made resulted in a peyote. These they shot as they climbed, and each was shot four times. When they had finished shooting their arrows, they left their tobacco gourds, sandals, hats, feathers, and pouches. Then each helped to enclose the circle, according to the demand of Tatavari. In the middle, a spray of foam sprang up. This was the deer, which was an enormous peyote. One side was green, one white, one red, another black, and another yellow. By means of these colors from the peyote, each of the hunters painted his face. These colors are the life. The peyote was left clean. While we did not use arrows to shoot the peyote, Clemente did explain to us on our hunt about the peyote growing in the tracks of the blue deer and about the various colors to be found in the hairs and the flowers of the buttons. The myth goes on to recount the first eating of the peyote. Then those who carried the paraphernalia arranged an altar around the peyote deer, and here they prayed. Tatavari ordered them to put tobacco in their mouths and swallow the juice. This we were not asked to do, thank heavens, although offerings of tobacco were made. I suspect this detail may be unreliable in one real's account, since the myth we have goes on to say that this, combined with their fatigue and the effects of their fast and thirst, made them extremely sick, and they fell down and prayed, leaving their paraphernalia. There's an interesting connection here of tobacco shamanism and peyote shamanism, which one also finds in the Peruvian Amazon. Now they lighted many candles in the midst of the peyote. The color put on their faces went to their hearts and made them curers, or curanderos. Then they got the grass and cleaned the peyote, cleaning off the skin to get the pure heart which was cut up. Even the husk of the peyotes was brought back. A pile twelve inches high was made of the peyote, and Tatavari gave a bit to each person. The peyotes were finally ready to be placed in newly washed gourds, while the men prayed to the deer. 
now they could eat of the peyote. It caused green spittle in the mouth. What was left, they put in their pouches to carry back to their homes. Having now eaten the peyote, they could finally drink water. Then Tatavari said, Fill your gourds with water and drink your fill. Also eat your tortillas. Thus you may have life for a long time to come. Elder brother Deer then said, Let us each eat half of the large peyote. This they did, and Tatavari said, In five years you will know how to sing, cure, and be a shaman. Then they went on for one more day to where there is peyote. By this time they were drunk from eating so much peyote, and thus some had to help the others. Here, where the ground is covered with peyote, they waited. We can note here that drunk, um, in Zinc Spanish here, borracho, may not have its usual connotations, but perhaps a widened sense of sacred intoxication. On the other hand, in these myths, it sometimes does seem that drunk really just means drunk. Tatavari goes on to caution, Do not remember your home or your mother, but work hard. From the fire which they carried, these members of the first peyote pilgrimage made a fire, and at night, while Tatavari sang, they gathered around it. At midnight, the house, the mother said, The men can be given food. So she sent ten women with tamales, tortillas, and such, as their reward for having brought here the ceremonial paraphernalia. Food will take away their peyote drunk, she said, so they were given bitter black atole, or corn mush. Having returned with the peyote, the myth goes on to describe the magic deer horn food, or peyote potion, that might make all but the very strong go crazy. Quote, Meanwhile, Kumukame in the underworld was singing to the rain gods. At the same time, Tatavari was singing to the fire people above. Those in the underworld heard the singing of Tatavari, Grandfather Fire, and he said, Those people are coming, and they think we are crazy, but let them come. Kumukame himself did not fear the magic liquor or sacred drink of the deer horn, the peyote potion, and he was given two bowls of the liquid, but it only made him drunk, nor did it harm the party of Tatavari. The others, however, were driven crazy and staggered away. Thus in the morning, only the men of Tatavari were fit to hunt the deer, peyote. The other party remained in a drunken stupor from the deer horn. This clearly underlining that only the proper followers of Grandfather Fire and the Wolf Father, that is, those who are guided by the ancestral gods, can eat peyote to good effect. At dawn, the sun, Tao, came out to replace the moonlight. For once the deer, peyote, had been killed, the sun could come out. This is a much shorter reference to a longer myth we'll look at in a moment about the first rising of the sun. But it marks the end of this particular cycle of myths which began in the west in San Blaise with the white rock of life that moved through the first deer hunt to the sacred lands in Wirikuta around Real de Catorce and which ends with the blessing of the gods on the establishing of the first peyote ceremonials and the rise of the sun for the first time. And this leads us, having completed our own peyote hunt, to the all-night hickory ceremony. So somewhat in parallel with this first myth, the third in the anthology that we've just covered, our ceremony with Clemente and Hermenegildo, interestingly elder and younger brothers, like elder brother and younger brother Deer, Cayumare and Parietzka, began at sunset at a ceremonial fire pit near the residence, which you can see here in a picture. As the sun set, Grandfather Fire, Tatavari, was kindled with prayers and ceremony, offerings of tobacco and the lighting of sacred candles again for each individual, more prayers and the asking for permission. This was followed by a ritual of public confession and asking for forgiveness, healing and growth. As you can learn about in the documentaries this week, the public confession traditionally involves stating everyone you've ever slept with, which can cause a lot of emotional upheaval, even retribution, in small village communities. In our case, it involved first a silent confession to Tatavari, Grandfather Fire, and a public confession of anything we sought forgiveness for. The condition for success was earnestness, vulnerability, and humility. We then stated our intentions in coming to the desert, to Cayumare, in the hopes that he might accept our journey. Then we partook of the first round of hickory, literally eating the god we had just hunted. We are right to be cautious with the term sacrament, 
here with its Euro-Christian baggage, but it's hard to avoid all comparisons with the Eucharist. For the Wirarika, the consuming of their God involves ongoing reciprocity throughout the ceremony, which began with Haramara and which continued here with a continual giving back of tobacco, sage, chocolate, candles and prayers between participants in the fire. At the opening of our all-night ceremony, Clemente then narrated a long myth in Spanish, only fragments of which we understood in lifetime translation. From what I could make out, the myths ranged over quite similar stories in the Zing, and it concluded with the naming of the sun by Turkey, which is recounted in the next myth we're reading this week. As that myth tells us, then Tatavari said, Who is that coming out? Let us see. Who can tell the name of the sun? The purpose of our all-night vigil was indeed, and above all, to honor and keep Grandfather Fire tended through the night, so that by morning he could lend his little light to the bigger light of the dawning sun. As the myth we were reenacting states, the sun was truly coming out for the first time, because of the success of the deer hunt. Indeed, Tatavari had left his vote of bulls upon the killing of the deer and become the sun. However, none of the people or the gods could name the sun, as the myth goes on and as Clemente recounted. It was Turkey, and he let out his neck. The fire asked him if he knew. Now although Turkey could not talk, he could make sounds. He strutted arrogantly about and beat the earth many times with his wings. His neck grew longer and longer and trembled. Finally he cried, Tau! 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 The sea people lost, and Turkey won. Thus it was in the olden times, as given down by the ancients. If Tatavari and other deities such as his consort, Takutsi Nakawe, Nuestra Abuela, or Grandmother Goddess of Fertility Growth and the Night, was displeased by our ritual, and if he went out, there was a real chance, we were told, the sun would not dawn. I was reminded of David Hume's famous contention that the sun will not rise tomorrow is as logical a statement as that the sun will rise. Only experience and empirical verification the next morning can determine whether the sun will rise or not, never a priori or causal reasoning. More superstitiously, if the light of anyone's candle went out in the strong winds that were blowing, this meant, according to the version Zinc recorded, that somebody would die. Luckily for us, that didn't happen. For the Wirarika, the highly structured all-night ritual, involving strict protocols and round after round of sacred prayers, singing, eating of peyote, and dancing, reenacts the first dawning of Tayao over Wirikuta. There was a palpable sense in the frigid and smoky desert night that we were in need of the sun's return and were participating in his rebirth. Thankfully, due to the help of Kayumare and others, the sun did eventually rise, and we could hear Turkey, along with other animals, naming the sun, as if for the first time. Of course, only Turkey getting his name right. Since most of the myths that Clemente recounted in his opening volley in Spanish were alternative retellings of the first and second myths presented in the Zing anthology, let's turn to the rest of those tales now. Note. Since no photographs could be taken during the ceremony, this image on the left is from another fire pit, not designated for the sacred ceremony from the night before. The first myth in the Zinc anthology is the one that seems most relevant to the all-night ceremony that we participated in. It's called The Birth of Tatavari, Grandfather Fire, and the Contest of Fire and Water, Nakawe. It begins, Tatavari was born in the first times. Before then, the people had no fire. Tatavari was born as a very small spark on a round rock near the point of the sea. In those times, it was quite dark, because there was neither fire nor sun. The people wondered how they might remedy this darkness. When the fire came out of the rock, it half flew, like a will of the wisp. The god people did not know what it was. The next night, the fire came out again. The people did not approach the rock because they thought the fire was very ugly. Fire came from the rock four times and flew to each of the four points. The fifth time, it flew past the god people like the firefly 
Tawiyami and encircled them. They did not recognize it, however. So for another five days, fire flew to the different directions. This time it was larger and looked like a mirror flashing in the sun. It was glowing also like a firefly and was looking for a house where it might be able to live. Someone said, this must be one of the great gods who has just been born. Ask what it is. Perhaps it is an animal. So they went and asked Kayumare. Kayumare told them that what they saw was fire and it would serve the people's use because it would give both heat and light. He advised them to await calmly and patiently to see what would happen. The following five days, fire flew to the five points. This time, it was as big as a tiapali, a sacred disc, and was burning brightly. A young boy and a young girl who had never had sexual intercourse were told to go and watch it. It was too delicate for older people. This is the first of many references from Zink's informant regarding the Wirarica understanding of the sacred in Spanish sagrados as delicate, delicados. Here, sexual purity and innocence is a precondition for engaging with and seeing who Grandfather Fire really is. The boy and the girl find Grandfather Fire issuing from a rock, an igneous situation, and the sight stupefies them. They no longer remember their errand to fetch and tame the fire. Wonder is here in the myth the precondition of the right relation to the sacred or the delicate, and also indicates the extraordinary astonishment or awe which makes control and mastery of sacred fire almost impossible. While they were drunk, Grandfather Fire spoke to the couple, saying, I am talking to you because I like you and your people. I have talked to all the other great gods. We wish you to make me five little tiapali. Tatavari's instructions to the young couple are numerous and detailed, and they all emphasize the delicate or tender aspects of the sacred and also its danger, delicado also meaning volatile, even angry or destructive. Tatavari ends his first speech to the couple so, Remember what I have said and tell your people, come back to me with your offerings in five days and see what you find. My name is Tai, fire. The boy and girl recovered from their drunken stupor. They returned home and told the people what Tatavari had said. For five days they were busy, preparing the things that had been requested of them. This was all in the time of darkness, when human beings ate as animals, without cooked food. Grandfather Fire charged the couple to be masters, dueños of the fire and the shrines. Much care, caution, and sacred obligation is necessary, because, as Grandfather Fire says over and again in this myth, I am very delicate. I cannot leave here, or I should set the world on fire. Nevertheless, no amount of attentive care and sacred caution is enough, and the uppity coals burn everything they contact, making Grandfather Fire exclaim, I am indeed the most delicate of all the gods. I cannot move. I burn everything in sight. Take rather my feathers to the gods of the five points. There place them on my five tiapali that you have brought and pray to them. The couple succeeds eventually in mastering the fire for the people, and becoming the first major domos or custodians of the paraphernalia, offerings and ritual. But the story doesn't end there. Now that there was fire, the whole world began to burn up, because fire was so delicate. This was very serious. The people hurriedly made an oven in which to save the paraphernalia of the fire god. Everything thrown at the conflagration simply becomes part of it. And so the people placed a top on the oven, and on the tiapoli they set a little fire in hopes of attracting the clouds. As they did this, they prayed to Nakawe and the great gods of the sea water. Nakawe heard the prayers. She loosened her hairnet, thereby releasing much rain which fell heavily. It rained for five days and nights. The fire was put out completely, except for that on the tiapoli on the top of the earth oven. Thus was the fire conquered. Many more ritual practices are instituted at this point in the myth for safe use of the sacred fire, including the boy's first trapping and sacrifice of a deer and the offering of sacrificed deer blood to Grandfather Fire, an anointing of the arrow tips and paraphernalia 
in deer blood, as well as the first institution of the singing Marakame, all traditions that are still very much alive today. Quote, and the custom had been followed by the Wichol ever since, according to the wishes of the great gods of the sea. Thus the Wichols became the family of Grandfather Fire. When this was done, Grandfather Fire was tamed and was no longer delicate. But again, the tale is still not over. The fire has to be watched vigilantly during the night for fear that Grandfather Fire would escape or that bad people would steal it. Eventually, the watchers start to doze off during the night, which creates an opportunity for opossum. That night, the fourth, a little animal, opossum, decided to try to steal the fire while the foolish watchers were asleep. He approached very quietly and with much care, deliberately leaving a track to see if the watchers would recognize it. When he came very near the fire, a spark leapt out from fear, but the watchers did not notice because they were asleep. This is one of the stories Clemente narrated at length during the opening parts of the ceremony, Opossum's Theft of the Fire. Having been scared off by the spark, Opossum backs off on the fourth night but returns on subsequent nights, eventually mustering up the courage to steal some fire. He opened his breast and hid the fire in his heart. Then he closed his breast and went away to a rock that has five holes in it, here he buried the fire. Kayumare was called by the great gods of the sea to investigate the missing fire, and he warns the watchers to take better care, lest they would lose Grandfather Fire. Despite these warnings, and since Kayumare was half bad as overseer, Kayumare is always half bad in these myths, a trickster, shaman, or Marakame, the watchers continued to fall asleep, and Opossum continued to steal the fire, bit by bit, until there was little fire left. The fifth night they awoke to see the animal opossum running away with the fire. He was climbing the hill with the fire burning in his heart. They ran to overtake him, but he got into his hole and they could not get at him. As a consequence of these repeated thefts, the fire was left very small. Darkness almost overpowered the people. The great gods were angry. The people were warned that if they lost the little bit of fire that remained, it would be the end of the Wichol, who are the children of the fire god. The next night, the animal, a possum, succeeded in stealing the last of the fire. The watchers had extreme difficulty in following it in the dark, but they finally caught the animal, killed it, and took out its heart of fire. But as soon as the people left, the animal, a possum, collected itself together and ran away, no worse for its misadventure. The people again caught it, knocked it to pieces, and hung it up by its tail. The animal composed itself again, however, and went back to its house. It was reborn within the hole where its heart had been. From this hole also its young were born, its teats were on the inside. The tale thus ends with the people deciding to use a possum's fat as an ointment, and allowing it to live from the corn of the witchels because of the injuries they had given it, and of course, its miraculous resurrections. My Spanish no longer being up to the task, I had little clue what variations there were in Clemente's version of this tale recounted near the beginning of the ceremony. It did seem the moral lesson was being drawn that during the ceremony we would protect Grandfather Fire and stay vigilant over our own hearts of fire, thereby honoring Opossum's lesson for the Huichols, in some sense dying and being reborn along with Opossum and not allowing our hearts to turn to stone. Alongside Opossum's tale, the ritual we experienced was oriented next by the myth of the rise of Tayao, Nuestro Padre, or the Sun Myth, up next in the Zinc Anthology. And I believe Clemente related parts of this myth as well. This will be the last myth we'll read in some detail before going into aspects of the ceremony itself and participant reports. The sun myth in the Zinc Anthology is particularly beautiful in its metaphors and imagery of the family and the animals of the sun, and how they were all born in the underworld during five days. The great gods of the sea did not know what these new creatures were, since they came out of the sea as green-blue spray. The next time, some came out as yellow spray. Finally, others came out as red foam. This was their hearts. From this spray emerged a small fly, 
and later a little sea bug. It flew to the arrows of the great gods of the sea. Then it returned to its father, the sun. The sun father said, spread your wings and later fly like the bird. The sound of the wings of the sea bug went out to the five corners of the world. At the sea, the great gods did not know what the sound could possibly mean. They thought that the water was angry. The sun father sent the little sea bug to find out if he would fit, if there was a place for him. If the heart, that is the small sea bug, fit, then there would also be a place for father son. It was supposed to fly in the wind to the point of the sea, so it went, measuring the world like a measuring worm, until it arrived at the point of the sea, which became very red. Here the bird placed an upright cross so that his children could climb to the sky. The little heart animal, bird or sea bug, stopped at the top of the cross, the axis mundi or ladder of the world. Then singing, it flew to the sky. After this, it returned to a tree of the great gods of the sea, the Lapa Matarial. Then the sun father changed the heart into a bug, which was able to sound its wings. This bug, called Tawalika, lives in the arroyos of Huichol country. In this form, the heart flew to this side. Here it sounded its wings. Kayumare watched as he had been commanded by the great gods of the sea. In these times, there was only the light of the moon. The sun had not yet been born. The bug went to all the world regions. The fifth time he went on that side. Here Kayumare made a ladder on which the sun could climb out of the underworld. Climbing out of the underworld, Father Sun emerged without any clothes on, and he spit in the sea, and another animal came out. This was a small woodpecker. The bird flew to that side. Here he sat on an arrow, which he pecked. Then he sat on the vote of bulls. Kayumare continued to watch. Then Father Sun sat down in a shaman's chair. He spat again. This time the long-beaked bird came out. Again Father Sun spat. A macaw came out and sat on the cross. There it was changed into a painting on a votive bull, and ten of its feathers fell out. The macaw sat on the limbs of the matarial, the world tree of the sea, and beat his wings. Small parrots came from the wings and flew to the five points. The sun was still very delicate and could not go about. Kayumare watched him closely, remembering everything in his heart. The sun spit again. From the foam came the great royal eagle, spreading its magnificent wings. It flew to the cross, then it flew to the shaman's chair of the sun. This bird belonged to him. Again the sun spat. This time a hawk came out. The hawk left its image on the door, and then it went to the mountains. Here it remained to guard the sun because it belonged very much to him. The black hawk emerged also at the sun's spitting and sat on the sun's chair. The sun said, You must take care of me, otherwise the sea gods will harm me. Let us see who will win. Again the sun spit and the rattlesnake came out. Kayumare wondered what it was for. The snake climbed over the chair of father's son and rested at his feet. Thus the sun watched, surrounded on all sides by many protectors, the eagle, the hawk, and the serpents at his feet. Kayumare also watched and noted everything. The sun said, Here I will arrange all my animals. Now a sea animal or tigre del mar, tiger of the sea, possibly a shark, came out of the sea when the sun spit, and then he told all his animals to defend him against his enemies. A fearful cry was heard from the sea, and from the foam a jaguar emerged. Father Sun, having come out of the underworld, but not yet having risen into the sky, gathered to him these and many other sacred animals, many wands and plumes and other magical paraphernalia, and sat in his shaman's chair in a sacred cave. Now the great gods of the sea were jealous of this paraphernalia. Kayumare, who was at first skeptical of the sun's success, then goes about making many votive gourds and painted niakali aspects of all that the sun had gathered around him. At this time, 
The moon was not very well arranged and did not give much light. It was therefore important that the sun come out. If Cayumare had failed in his work, the world would have remained as dark as a cave. As the myth goes on, although the great gods of the sea try to kill the animals of the sun with arrows, the sun's rays blind their aim, and eventually the sun is able to leave his chair and climb to the sky to shine. He was very delicate, though, and had to be gentled or tamed. The myth of the contest to name the sun is also told in this third myth in the anthology, in more detail, with Turkey again carrying off the unexpected win. None of the gods of the sea, who were afraid of the sun and his animals, knew his name, and even the aspect, Nialika, of the sea changed to green and blue due to their fear and reverence. Then the sun arose from his chair. He ordered his animals to the four points to guard and protect him from anyone who might try to kill him. After this, he climbed the cross at the side of the sea. Then he went to the four points, slaying the darkness on all sides with heavy blows. As the sun was climbing away, Turkey, who was standing behind the great gods, finally gobbled, Tau, Tau, Tau. Thus he named the sun. The sun climbed to the top of the sky. In the afternoon, he had to descend into the sea. This was very dangerous for him because he was still tender and because the snakes, that is water in the sea, would try to kill him. The myth goes on to narrate Father Sun's naming and ordering of the world, his animals and the rituals. But before long, because he was still young and tender, the sun fell into the sea. The world became dark and the night animals were emboldened by the darkness. The people, great gods of the sea, were again afraid of the animals. They tried to keep the beasts away by making a great noise all night. For five days it remained dark because the sun was very tender and not as strong as he is now. But at the end of this time he again climbed to the sky and there shone in the full splendor of the finest Wichol man's costume. Throughout this myth, Cayumare's making of paraphernalia and a huge number of sacred rituals to worship the sun is essential to strengthen the sun enough for its return, thereby becoming more reliable, less tender and delicate. Tatavari, Grandfather Fire, is also called in to help make the sun's shaman chair and teach the songs and the myths that would be able to tame the sun. Now, if the great gods of the sea could understand and remember these songs, the sun would be gentled. Further, the great gods who had charge of the temple had become sacred, delicado, for five years, according to the command of the sun. So even the great gods themselves have to apprentice and are delicate before the sun. As the myth tells us, these were the first all-night ceremonials of the singing Marikames. The people still took their places around the fire so that they might listen to the myth-telling. Five days passed while the people went without sleep and worked at myth-telling. Then the shaman Tatavari said, Now we are approaching the end. A child must sing tonight, according to the command of the sun. This is the child Kayumare Marakame, or singing shaman, and he was ashamed before the old man, Tatavari, grandfather fire. Kayumare was not even big enough to fill the shaman's chair. But the child shaman tried to find out why the remedies did not work. He took his shaman's basket from the plumes and learned that offerings would have to be made to the sun. Thus the sun revealed what must be done for the sickness. At first, Tatavari thought that the myth-telling had not been very good, so they talked in the ancient language of the first times. The boy shaman told the people that he hardly knew how to dream since he was only a child. He was only fit for play, and the only gods he knew were the sun and the fire. Indeed, Grandfather Fire had to sit beside him so that the others would not say he was a fool and his myth-telling wrong. At dusk, the boy singer began to narrate this myth of the sun, for the people were dying from the disease with no relief whatsoever. Then he began to sing. The great gods sat in shaman's chairs on all sides of the child shaman. He, however, sat in the god's chair. On each side of him was an old chanter to assist him. So they fasted and performed the work 
that the boy singer had said would gain the favor of the sun. During the five days that the work was going on, they had to kill a deer. The boy singer carried chocolate, bread, grape wine, and two large candles, as well as a votive bowl. The candles were to be tied to the horns, antlers of the deer. As soon as the pilgrims returned, these were bathed in the sacred water from the sea. Also, the old men told the myths of the first times and thus explained the owners and significances of everything. For Nakawe, the people wove a shirt of ixtal, a fiber of agave, as a decoration for an image of this goddess, and also to offer to her as a garment. Finally, the boy singer was successful, and all his and the sun's orders were carried out, such as lighting candles to strengthen the sun, and that the candles should be turned over to him by being offered, lighted, as he rose. For all these and many other altar rituals, including the rattlesnake rattles, offerings of chocolate, wine, sotol, bread, candles, tesquino, corn beer, and the anointing of sacred objects in deer blood, and many other rituals, Kayumare, the first professional child shaman, collected a fee of $50. Now that the sickness was gone, the people could make a feast of deer soup. The myth goes on to tell several sub-stories which offer a somewhat cautionary tale about the validity of Zink's 1934 informant Juan Real. The tale goes on to relate the comical battle between Jimson Weed Man, who uses the pollen of the flowers of the Datura root and is a bad shaman, versus Kayomare, who uses peyote and is only half bad, mostly good. For his false singing, which was pure deception and would produce great harm, Jimson Weed Man collects a large fee, leaving the people sick and impoverished. Kayumare is dispatched by Tatavari to make things right. Kayumare punishes and burns Jimson Weed Man to ashes, but Jimson Weed is reborn and under the tutelage of the sun becomes a little less bad. After austerities, he is tamed by the gods and continues his detour shamanism, now being married to Armadillo Woman in wilderness solitude. As Jimson Weed sang, the cliffs listened and chanted the replies. The wind made the violin play, and the beata sounded like a drum. His tobacco gourds were changed into acorns. The sound of the wind through the acorns and the oak leaves was the music of the flute. The rocks danced, because Jimson Weed lives near the rocks. Since Jimson Weed was still half bad, and since the female armadillo had lived with him, she was changed from a great sea goddess and had to assume her shell. Kayumare noted all this. He ordered the sacred clowns to carry the armadillo in their custom. Then the Jimson Weed singer finished his feast, as the Wichols still do for black magic. Now in fact, as J. Courtney Fikes has pointed out, on the basis of decades of fieldwork and the testimony of a Kiri shaman, Jesus Gonzalez Mercado, Zing and possibly Juan Real misidentify the plant here used by the bad shaman as Datura, when in fact it is the sacred flower of the plant Kieri. As Fikes writes, Zink should never have accepted at face value certain information and myths provided by Juan Real, who was Zink's source about Kieri. Hence, they mistakenly identified Datura as Kieri, an error that took some 45 years to resolve. Before publishing those myths, Zinc should have visited the plant that Rial described and or ascertained more about Rial's probable lack of first-hand experience with it. Zinc's misidentification of Kiri as Datura and defamation of Kiri as evil were ethnographic mistakes exacerbated in the earliest publications about Kiri authored by Dr. First and Meyerhoff. Kiri is a plant in the genus Solandra, very occasionally used to make hallucinogenic honey it is considered too dangerous physically and spiritually to consume, as well as a temperamental ally who exacts great devotions or punishments. So Kiri shamans are very rare, although Kiri plants are widely worshipped and offered to, and form a major basis of the earliest Wirarika religious mythology, before being mainly eclipsed by the peyote pilgrimage. Check out Jay Fikes' great book Beyond Peyote for more on this. So as the sub-stories in the Zinc continues for this myth, Kayumare counteracts the black magic of Kiri with peyote, perhaps indicating Kiri's falling out of cultural memory and usage during the period. 
In the zinc myth, peyote, which is distributed among the people by Cayumare and his followers, takes on the status of a pure good, a blessing, which protects the people, although it is often consumed alongside gourds of tesquino, corn beer, which makes for drunkenness, dancing and singing, and associates it with an effect that can be difficult to control. Cayumare has to calm the people with more peyote and singing, since before this, even the women were drunk like the men and tore off their clothes. Cayumare also sprinkled them with sacred water to make them sober. Cayumare learned in his singing that, as a payment to placate the sun, ceremonial paraphernalia would have to be taken to the peyote country near Real de Catorce, San Luis Potosi. So he ordered the people to dance the peyote dance, the hikuri nieli, and he told them to dress in their best clothes so that the sun could hear. He had them dance with a carved wand. This work had to be done by the witchels every day for five days without rest or food. Although, unfortunately, we did not dance in the peyote ceremony for five days. Throughout the night and during the various rounds of praying, singing and eating peyote, we did do the blue deer or peyote dance around the fire and found ourselves spiraling therein, alongside the music, into the Wurarika Cosmovision. Although it is almost 300 years old and likely does not describe a Wirarica hickory ceremony, Padre José de Ortega's description of a peyote dance still communicates something of the spirit of what we experience. They began by forming a circle of many men and women as would fill the space, which had been swept off for this purpose. One after the other went dancing into this circle or kept time with his feet, keeping in the middle the musician and the choir master whom they had invited and singing in the same cacographic tune that he set them. They danced from five o'clock in the afternoon to seven o'clock in the morning, without stopping or leaving the circle. Much less of an ordered ceremonial than what we experienced, but the cacographic tune that's described here, and the intensity of the ritual, as well as the encouragement not to stop or leave the circle, were the same. As Dale Pendel puts the ceremonial experience, peyote like maize can read one's thoughts, just as it is important not to go into the cornfields with bad thoughts, one must be fully purified before meeting peyote. That one's inner state is a dynamic force affecting the whole universe is an axiom of our way. Levi Brule called it the logic of participation. It is nowhere more serious than with sacred medicines. And I recalled here during the ceremony again a quote from Antonin Artaud this time about the Tarahumara, but applying equally well to the Burarika. They are obsessed with philosophy, and they are obsessed to the point of a kind of physiological magic. With them, there is no such thing as a wasted gesture, a gesture that does not have an immediate philosophical meaning. The night continued with many rounds of hickory and song. For we are all, we are all, we are all children of, we are all sons of, a brilliantly colored flower a flaming flower, and there is no one, there is no one who regrets what we are, as sung in an old Wirarika song, possibly referring to Kiri. The conclusion of the third anthologized sun myth in the Zinc reads, this ceremony, referring to the next rounds of highly ordered rituals, finally tamed the sun. The witchels continue to do it to keep the sun tame. If this were not done, the sun would remain in his cave and all the world would be dark or else he would be wild and coming too close to the earth, he would burn and dry up the world. Then they came out and the animals and the birds chose places on the earth that they wished for homes. The people had the hard work of taming the sun, but it was done. The sun ordered five gates to be made at the different directions of the place where he had been born. And it was here that the sun had rested while the people were giving ceremonies to tame him. He had rested in his shaman's chair. So the all-night hickory ceremony we experienced was certainly challenging. After days of pilgrimage and hunting the blue deer in the deserts of Wirikuta, participants had to stay in the circle from sunset to sunrise, partaking of rounds of offering, hickory, prayers, songs, drum, rattle, and dance. Movement around Grandfather Fire, Tetavari, was also circumscribed, counterclockwise before midnight, then clockwise again after the sun rose. The circle could only be left or re-entered at specific openings for bathroom breaks 
or to get warmer clothes as the night grew colder. As the ceremony progressed, the fire became a visionary crucible that slowed the world into the halting eternity of its constant flow and flux. Here, Heraclitus's becoming seemed to be one with Parmenides's being, revealing hieroglyphs of meaning in the fire. The fire became much more than a campfire. It was manifesting as the god itself in his own proper person, Tatavari. The natural environment and stars as well became luminous and alive with hidden messages. In an excellent interview linked in the module for this week, Oscar Matsuwa discusses all things Wirarika and Peori, and at one point describes the connection with Grandfather Fire, Tatavari, that we got a glimpse of. Quote, Tatavari is our main guide, the one who teaches the path, also protects us in all the ceremonies we do, and also teaches us how to heal. We use this energy, the fire energy, to heal people. We work through the fire. He helps to transmute all negative energy and sickness into something good. He gives us the light and the clarity and shows us the visions and the sacred messengers of the universe. For us, the fire is our library, which shows the history of the universe. We see in the fire the vision. When you're ready to connect with the fire, he can show you the history of different things or whatever you ask. He will respond to you, but you need to have this connection. For this connection, you need many years, as with the water, the wind, and the earth. It all takes time and commitment to arrive at this point, to have this connection and this communication. This is a strong commitment and a very long way to go. You can listen to the whole interview here, as well as the write-up for Entheon Nation. And Oscar also has a really good sound cloud with medicine music in the, in the Wirarika and other traditions. Alongside the fire itself, as Tatavari, most impressive during the all-night ceremony was Clemente's prayers and singing, and Hermenedilgo's violin playing, as well as the many deer dances of our group around the fire in a sharp staccato movement that plunged us into the aboriginal time of Wirarika ancestors, repeatedly evoking for us the very first and timeless gatherings around the fire. At some moments, I read inwardly a few Orphic hymns, to Fusus or nature, to Kronos or time, to Dio or Demeter, and to Apollo, as well as poetry about honoring sacred silence in the German mystic Angelus Cilicius, while others made offerings of medicine songs, flute, rattle, sacred tobacco, and evermore prayers. Whereas in my earlier journey, in 2002, I met Kayumare in a dream, now I came to encounter and relationship with Tatavari, to Kutsi Nakawe and Taiho. Kayumare himself was present strongly, however, in Clemente's aura, prayers and songs, which were so beautiful, hypnotic and heartfelt. Although we lacked the Wirarika language for a deeper appreciation of the meaning, the experience was deeply healing, and most everyone felt renewed and refreshed throughout the next few days. As the ceremony closed, the sun rose and we lit our candles again and offered them to the fire along with our gratitude, Pamparios, the Wirarka word for thank you. Thinking about the emotional experience of the ceremony, I was reminded of the words of a Washo peyote man quoted by Pendel from Straight with the Medicine. You have to think about your own life and how you want to be. Then you will feel that feeling coming inside of you. It is like you will cry. A grown man can't cry unless he is hurt bad. Well, it's like that like you are hurt bad, like you feel sorry for yourself, how no good you are, and how you haven't done anything good for yourself or anyone. The feeling just starts coming out of your body. You can't help it. The words come with it. The words come right out of your body. Then you start talking good like you never did before. You feel strong and good like a real man. Then you feel strong enough to help other people along a bit. That's what real Indian praying is or as Dale closes his chapter on the ally peyote, have you come full circle now so that you can pray with us who have sat up all night here eating peyote? Will you be with us here when Water Woman enters in the morning, when the Water Woman, as beautiful as the Goddess of Mercy, enters at dawn with food and water, when she takes your hand and wishes you the first good morning of your new life? And that's exactly what happened in the morning after our ceremony 
as it had been arranged for two local water women to bring water, coffee, and prepare a breakfast for us, an excellent breakfast for us for the new day. Here are a few pictures of participants before the ceremony. That's Sergei, Eric, Terry, and Marissa. And of the sacred Wirakuta mountain ranges that oversaw our journey here. Several participants kept journals during the entire pilgrimage experience and subsequent to the ceremony. And so I'd now like to read you a few excerpts or participant reports from the night of the ceremony. Marissa writes, The all-encompassing scent of camphor, copal, and sage, the hypnotizing nature of gazing into the fire, the melodic sounds of the Wirarika's instruments, zombie-like stupefaction the day after, wandering around in a trance, wondering how I could ever possibly integrate this or recollect the shattered pieces of consciousness, feeling caught in between worlds, scarcely cognizant of the world around me, the line I came up with that I think of often, yearning for soul ignition, but the self-starting fire must come from within, feeling as if I now contain a piece of grandfather fire within me, ready to contribute and share this gift to the world. The sensation of knowing what remains within me after I felt as if I had nothing left and all life had dissolved away, at times looking over my shoulder for a guardian or a comforter, force of habit, but realizing I had the inner strength within me. Turning towards the east, awaiting the sunrise, feeling like an archaic human, relying upon the fire and others for survival, awakening the phylogenetically older structures of the brain, feeling so much energy in my sacrum at times and wondering why it wasn't traveling up my spinal column. The elation of giving in to dance, blue deer dance around the fire, as others did so, feeling the spirit of the Wirarika's violin and fiddle, the sacredness of all the songs I heard from others in the group, dreamtime hypnosis during the peak of fervor before things became more inward integration focused, when it seemed the time for a bacchic release of some sort. Others hugging deeply and expressing their love and gratitude for one another. Terry telling me I'll be okay, which I knew to be true coming from her. The log that looked like a serpent, Makawe, facing towards the two women, Terry and myself apparently, seeing us all as archetypes around the fire. The trickster magician, the fighter warrior, the wise sage, the mother grandfather, the maiden, the hugs and healing that made me feel safe. You are safe. We love you. You are beautiful. Respected. The feeling of great power residing within me and the catharsis from my chest and up my vertebrae, feeling safe and honored for being a woman. Seen in the fire at various times, sylphs, salamanders, fishes swimming about, even the smiling face of Grandfather Fire, skulls, hellfire, the gates of hell and tormented souls, reminding myself of Orpheus and Eurydice to not look back as I make the ascent along the way out of Hades, feeling my mother and my ancestors and trying to communicate to her not to worry that I'll be okay. Night part of the ceremony, walking counterclockwise around the fire to honor the sacred lunar feminine energy. Then from midnight to dawn, walking clockwise to honor the solar masculine energy, truly appreciating the significance of rituals and honoring the divine. Pamparios, the Wirarka word for thank you, said after receiving the songs and prayers, after receiving the hickory medicine, peyote, touching the peyote to my third eye, right eye, left eye, mouth, throat, and heart before eating the custom, and truly setting my intentions and the healing energy for the continuing health and regeneration of each one. Feeling so grateful for all that they do, the importance of intuition and thanks for everyone for honoring us with their presence, unforgetting an amnesis of prior modes of consciousness, ways of being as we should be, singing, dancing around the fire, revealing our shadows, being there for one another, looking to the Marikami for guidance. And in some post-ceremony reflections, Marissa writes, the ceremony tapped into what life is really about at its core, at least some fundamental aspects or realities, Mialika, 
Ancient humans had a role, a fate in the cosmos. Modern people feel aimless and without cause, no inbuilt teleological reason for existence. This was an archetypal experience, in the sense Jung wrote about archetypes as images of instinct, being around the fire, singing, dancing, depending on one another, attuning to the elements, gods, a gateway into the realm of collective unforgetting, was an ecstatic transpersonal experience of being beyond myself, an experience of unity or oneness at times, feeling truly alive, all senses of fire, a living embodiment of countless ancestors, part of something both timeless and ineffable. The most difficult part was looking in the mirror the morning after and remembering who I was and how far I still had to go, how much I still needed to learn to forgive myself. Do I still view myself as a captive Persephone? I can rebuild myself, redefine myself, and transform my life. It will take some time to get there from my current situation, but I can make actions every day that assist me in getting there. The ceremony woke up the fire in me, ever forging, as in Goethe's Faust, eternal minds, eternal recreation. So that being a few of the participant reports, we come to the conclusion of this lecture and a brief discussion of some other fascinating myths in the zinc since we've really only covered the first three. The book as a whole is arranged in terms of myths of the dry season cycle and the wet season cycle, Tatavari and Tao and Takutsi Nakawe and other goddesses of the feminine. And it also includes the Christian myth cycle, which is really an astonishing part. In the dry season cycle, there are myths about the founding of the first Wichol temple, further myths of Kayumare's founding rituals in relation to the rain goddesses, and which our pilgrimage from San Blaise to Wirikuta were very much involved with, and Kayumare's various adventures of either outsmarting or being outsmarted by Wolfman, the Moon, and Hortaman, the Wind Devil. Although we don't have time to cover them in this video, maybe a future one, I found the myths in the wet season cycle to be especially compelling and well told, probably also because they lack the excessive ritual detail that characterized some of the dry season cycle. Especially excellent were the myths about the establishing of the corn ceremonies and feasts, and the amazing tale, the water and corn goddess, and the ant people, which I've included for your discussion posts. In the wet season cycle, we also hear of the creation of the first corn people, the struggle of the sun and the kawe, a Wichol flood myth, a myths involving toothed vaginas and other culture heroes, agricultural cycles, rites of passage, including ghost stories and myths of death, resurrection, and many an indigenized saint, especially myths of Guadalupe, Virgin Maria, and a musician, Jesus Christ. The range of myths in the Zinc is just astounding, even more so considering that this is an oral tradition with great regional and historical variation. It's hard to imagine he collected them all in just one year from one informant. However, on the downside, the myths were not edited for occasional incoherence of detail. It would be nice to see a professional storyteller, hopefully a bilingual Urarica, take the Zinc anthology and sit deeply with it alongside their own versions of the myth and work on a yet more compelling overall anthology. I'm sure I'll see something like that happen in my lifetime. Okay, so that brings us to the conclusion of this introduction to Wirarka mythology, Wichel Cosmovision, and the Hickory Pilgrimage. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and we'll see you next week. Pamparios, everyone!